Wow, what is going on? What's going on? Uh, it was vacation Bible school last week. That's right. It was vacation Bible school last week. I had the honor of uh, teaching Bible every single day last week to those kids. And we had a ton of fun. We learned about the jungle and learned about jungle animals. And it was decorated beautifully, right, for vacation Bible school. But the Bible time was really intense uh, because this year they didn't cover like a single Bible story or do a single theme. They covered the entire Bible. So they did from creation all the way to completion, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And so I was thinking, you know, if kindergartners can cover the entire Bible in a week, you and I we can do the entire Bible in 30 minutes, right? Of course, because I know we spend a lot of time in church looking very closely at the Bible, but sometimes when we're so close, we don't step back and see the big picture, how it all comes together. So hopefully today, this will encourage you, challenge you to read the Bible like never before because it is from God. And hopefully the tools that we give you today and the principles that we talk about will help you understand the Bible better. Because I think if a self-sufficient, self-reliant, all-powerful, intelligent, always existing, unique, good, moral God loved us enough to give us a book, then it should be the most amazing book ever. Right? And I stand before you today without a doubt whatsoever in my mind. I declare that the Bible is that book. And it's everything you need. The Bible is unique, it's in a class all by itself. It's accurate. That means you can trust every single word that it says. It is supernatural in that there are things in the Bible that only God could know. And it is transforming. Reading it should change your life. Okay? So let's do this. In Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection, Jesus is walking down the road and it's the story of the people, his disciples, walking to Emmaus. It's the road to Emmaus. And in the story, we have two people who are confused, confused about the cross, confused about what happened, and they're not sure if they're ready to believe the testimony of the women that the tomb was empty and that Jesus is alive. In fact, Jesus walks up beside them and they express this confusion to Jesus. And he says to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The Bible says Jesus used all the scriptures to talk about himself. And so they make the journey. They arrive back at the house. The two disciples invite Jesus in to have dinner with them. Jesus sits at the table. He breaks bread. He says a prayer, and then he vanishes. He just disappears. The Bible in the Greek says, he non-visible became. He non-visible became. He, he disappeared. And in verse 32, the disciples talk to each other and they say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scriptures? How did that happen? How did their hearts burn? Jesus opened up the scriptures. He talked to them about the things that are written in the Bible and they understood it. That's what learning is. They learned something. And then later in that same chapter, Jesus meets up with the disciples his own disciples, and he takes it a little further. Verse 44 says, Jesus says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law and the prophets, Moses and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures, so that they could understand the scriptures, right? That means the Bible has one ultimate theme, 
I know, we think about the Bible as being a whole bunch of stories with a whole bunch of messages or a whole bunch of rules. The Bible has one ultimate theme. The Bible has one compelling ultimate purpose. You see, the crazy thing about the Bible is there's unity there. When we talk about what belongs in the Bible and what doesn't, what got put in the Bible, what didn't, it's because it has one compelling theme. You have over 40 authors, uh, a a book that took over 1,500 years to write, written in three languages, written on three different continents, and yet there is one, one compelling theme, the coming of Christ. The coming of Christ, the story, all of it, all the story, it is about the coming of Christ. So yes, in Luke 24, we see Jesus open up the scriptures. He's talking to his uh, disciples so that they would understand, so that their hearts would burn. And this morning, I'm going to attempt to do the same thing, at least in some small way, to open up your minds to the scriptures so that our hearts burn, so that we are lifted up so that we realize, so that we understand that the, our Bible, the Bible that you have right now, has one ultimate, compelling, overriding theme. Theme, story, purpose, whatever you want to call it, the coming of Christ. Okay? So let's walk through it. Let's open up our minds to the scriptures and see this story and understand why it's so important. The Old Testament. The Old Testament comes first. Theme number one, Christ is coming. Theme number one, Christ is coming, the Old Testament. When you boil it all down, the coming of Jesus is pretty much what these 39 books, 929 chapters, 23,214 verses, 622,771 words in the Old Testament are all about. The Christ is coming. Understand, from Genesis all the way to Malachi, the Old Testament resonates with the good news, great joy for all people, Christ is coming. Christ is coming. In Genesis, Christ's coming is revealed for the very first time. In the very first few pages of the Bible, even before God makes the world. I mean, that's something that is hard for a lot of people to understand, but it's true. Even before God creates the world, before he meets a person from the earth, before he breathes life into him, God has already planned to send Jesus. Yes, Jesus' death on the cross was God's idea from before, from the beginning. Now, in the beginning, God creates the world. He creates everything in it. He creates Adam. He creates Eve. He places them into a garden paradise, and it's a perfect world with no sin, no corruption, no darkness. Picture that, right? That's hard. They had no restrictions. They had no restrictions save one command, and that was to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know the rest of the story. They were tempted. They were deceived by the snake. They blew it. They disobeyed God. They sinned. Their eyes were opened. They realized that they were naked. They hid from God, and God banished them from the garden paradise. And in Genesis 3.15, we find the first mention of the gospel. It is called the gospel in the garden, the proto-evangelion. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Even though, I mean, just understand this, even though humanity had turned its back on God and sinned, within this verse, God says, Yes, but I will not turn my back on humanity. Just like we read in 2 Samuel 14, all of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back, even when we have been separated from him. Now, in that passage, in Genesis 3.15, it reveals a couple of things that set up the rest of the Bible. The first is, darkness is ultimately going to be crushed. Darkness will ultimately be crushed. And the agent of that crushing will come through the seed of a woman. Now we know this to be Mary. The victory over sin is possible through the suffering servant who crushes the serpent. And we know this to be Jesus. 
And for centuries, Genesis 3.15 was the only ray of hope that, that, that God had given the people and that they clung to tightly. And then, about 2,000 years before Christ, God calls Abraham. We read about this in Genesis 12. And in this call, God reveals that the descendants of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the descendant of theirs would one day bless the entire earth. And that descendant is Jesus. And as God's first book nears its end, God reveals in Genesis 49 that one day a rest bringer would come from the royal line of Judah and would bring about a time of peace, would bring about a time of abundance. The theme of Genesis is Christ is coming. And from Exodus all the way to Esther, we prepare for Christ's coming. In those 16 books, God prepares his people in at least five different ways. The first of which is God prepares his people by delivering them. Now, as the book of Exodus opens, we see that God's people are slaves in Egypt and they're in shackles. And while they were in shackles, they, they learned that they needed a deliverer. They could not rescue themselves. They could not save themselves. They needed a deliverer. And so God became that deliverer. Exodus 3, 7 says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. God sees them. God hears them. God is concerned about them. In Exodus 3, it says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up and out. We serve a God who rescues us, who brings us up and out. Rescues them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so God sends Moses, and Moses is the, uh, he's the figurehead, right? And he says, let my people go, let God's people go. And God sends hail and frogs, and he turns the Nile into blood, and he, and he kills the firstborn of the Egyptians. He parts the Red Sea all through a servant. Moses is the servant. And it brings Pharaoh, and it brings a mighty empire like Egypt just down to its knees and the people are redeemed. The Israelites are redeemed and they have their freedom. Then God prepares his people by giving them the law. They needed to be delivered and then he gives them the law. The Israelites are, are not just on their own to do whatever they like. God has the right, God has the power to ask something of them. I delivered you and I ask something of you, and that is to obey the law. Exodus 20 says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's what I did for you. That's what I did for you. Now what are you going to do for me? You shall have no other gods before me. God prepared his people by giving them the law. He taught them about sin, about obedience, about holiness. His servant Moses brought them up to Mount Sinai, gave them tablets of stone. They were his commandments. And then God prepares his people by fulfilling his promise. The law was a promise between him and the people. And then God shows, I will keep my promise. In the book of Joshua, we read about a new leader coming in. He conquers Canaan. He establishes God's people and gives them the land that he had promised Abraham 700 years earlier, teaching them that your God is a lawgiver and he is a promise keeper. And again, God prepares his people by giving them the royal throne of David. Through whose bloodline, one day, that head, that serpent's head crusher will come. That redeemer will come from the royal line of David. Second Samuel 7 says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And then what does David do? David creates a temple. God prepares his people by building a temple so that we could worship him. He gave them a place. He gave them a place to allow sinful people to approach a holy God. He gave them a system. He gave them a place to do it in. And he prepared them all through the Old Testament by delivering them 
by giving them the law, by fulfilling his promise, by establishing the royal line of David, and by giving them a place to worship. In the next part of the Bible, we have the poets. And in the poets, we see this great desire for Christ's coming. The people have the desire to see Christ. In the book of Proverbs, there is a desire for wisdom. In, in the wisdom books, we, t- we learn about that wisdom is found in God. Wisdom is found in Christ. Then in Cle- Ecclesiastes, Solomon expresses the futility of living life without God. In Ecclesiastes, he says, I tried women, I tried wine, I tried wealth, and none of those things fulfilled me. I had those things in abundance, and they didn't fulfill me. I came up empty. Solomon dis- discovered, he understood that true and lasting meaning and fulfillment are not found. He says, they are not found under the sun. Those things are not found under the sun, but rather they are going to be found in one person, Jesus, who is the son, the son of God. In the Song of Solomon, Solomon aspires for perfect love, perfect commitment. And he said it can't be found in the opposite sex. It's only found in Christ. And then in Job and Psalms, we have all these direct and indirect references to the coming of Christ. In the book of Job, Job longs for a mediator. God is punishing him and he says, I wish there was someone between me and God, a lawyer, somebody I could talk to that would speak on my behalf. And he looks forward to a redeemer. Job says, I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another, how my heart yearns within me. David is the psalmist. And he comes in and he writes a song of a glorious son in Psalm 2, the great parable teller in Psalm 78, the Davidic king in Psalm 89, the royal priest in Psalm 110. King David longs for this glorious, perfect, perpetual reign of the Messiah. The next section of the Old Testament is the prophets. And the prophets look forward to Christ's coming with hope, with expectation, because the prophets lived during a time when God's people had turned their backs on God. They had turned their backs on God's word, turned their backs on God's law. And they were now bowing down and worshiping false gods. They had forgotten the God who delivered them out of Egypt. They had forgotten the promise. The people and their leaders, they were rotten, both Morally and spiritually, wrong had now become right and God was diminished. He was made small into a distant deity and worship had become nothing more than just heartless, going through the motions, just pretending, just performing. And God says in Isaiah, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Justice is nowhere to be found. The poor were oppressed. And this growing corruption eventually leads to the kingdom of Israel dividing. Brother fights against brother. And that's never a good thing. And the fall of Israel, the fall of Judah, as God judges the nation, the sword of the foreign comes in. A foreign superpower comes in. Assyria comes in and attacks. Babylon comes in and attacks. And the once mighty kingdom is no more. It was during this perilous, dark, difficult time that the prophets live, which is why they look forward to, they look forward to and cling to and spoke about this unwavering hope in a better kingdom. Isaiah, who was known as the uh, gospel prophet, wrote the 11th chapter of a kingdom that would be united by peace and harmony and that it would include all people. And he said, the lion will lie down with the lamb. In other words, all barriers, all walls between people will be broken down. Everyone will be humbled. Their natural enemies would now become friends. And Isaiah writes of a time with a better leader in a better kingdom. Isaiah 32 says, a king will rule in a way that brings justice and leaders will make fair decisions Then each ruler will be like a shelter from the wind, like a safe place in a storm, like streams of water in a dry land, like a cool shadow from a large rock in a hot land. And then in Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah paints us a picture 
of what this suffering servant would look like, what Jesus would look like, so that when we saw him, there would be no doubt. It says he has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, spitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment had brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The prophets were looking forward to a time when Christ would come and when the deep, deadly wound of sin was no more when the good news would be preached to the poor, when the captives would be set free, when the prisoners would be released, when the brokenhearted would be bound up and God's favor poured out. Jeremiah writes about the expectation and hope and a better relationship, a better covenant with God. Jeremiah says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sin no more. The message of the Old Testament is Christ is coming. And then you turn the page and you have the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The Gospels say Christ is here. Christ is here. The curtain parts and the headliner takes the sage. And suddenly all the energy of the room, the anticipation, everything erupts into joy. The band is playing, the cameras are flashing, the flags are waving. The wait is over. Our beloved is here. John 1.14 says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. When the Gospels begin, they start with Jesus' birth. The wait was over. A thousand years ago in the garden was over. The snake crusher has come. The Savior is here. And a great company of angels appears in the sky above Bethlehem, and they praise God, and they say, Glory to God in the highest of heaven and on earth, Peace, with whom his favor rests, the baby Jesus, in the arms of his mother. The baby grows up and becomes a boy. He laughs, he plays with friends, he wrestles with his brothers, he helps his dad in his carpenter shop, and by the age of 12, he's already sitting on the temple steps, listening and teaching their teachers. And Luke 2 says, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And that boy grows up and becomes a man. It says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. And by the age of 30, he starts his own ministry. A ministry where he healed the the blind, the lame, the leper. He even raised the dead. He changed water into wine. He calmed violent stores. He multiplied food. He spoke with authority. He spoke with divinity. He spoke with insight into the heart of every single person who listened. In fact, one time, some temple guards were sent to arrest Jesus. They came back empty-handed, and their only excuse was, he spoke like no one else today. And that is still true. But only three years into his ministry, he is betrayed by a friend, abandoned by his disciples, placed on a mock trial, beaten, spit upon, scourged, weak and bleeding, forced to carry his own cross, huge spikes driven into his hands and feet, and on the cross, he still has the vision of others before self. He takes care of his mother, and he pardons his enemies. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He was innocent. The Jewish leaders knew it. Pilate knew it. Jesus did nothing. Nor did he try to free himself. He died and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. Jesus is alive. Death could not hold our king. Do you feel the burn of the truth? The truth of the scriptures. And listen, those who are in Christ, likewise, 
death will not hold you either. You will be in heaven with him. Victory has been won. The serpent is crushed. Sin is defeated. Death is destroyed. The grave is no more. And because he lives, we can now be forgiven. And we have hope and we have purpose because sin has been erased. The Old Testament said Christ is coming. The Gospels said Christ is here. And then the letters say Christ is coming again. Jesus, the risen Lord, with his disciples the very last time in the book of Acts, he says, it is not for you to know the time or date the Father has set by his own authority, but you'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. And they were looking intently up at the sky as he was going. And then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who had been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And listen, throughout the book of Acts and the letters to the churches, God's people are shown that he is coming again. In Philippians, Paul writes, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. In Colossians, Paul writes, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Peter writes, Look forward to that day and speed its coming. John writes, And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. He writes, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and that we will be at, has, and what he will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We, the readers of this, should be just like they. We should find comfort and encouragement, even though we walk through dark times, even though we walk in a wicked world, to set our sights and our future hope on the fact that Christ is coming again. The world is not our home. We are just passing through on our way to victory. Does your heart burn? Does your heart burn as the scriptures are unfolded to you? And finally, we have the book of Revelation. And in Revelation, the theme is, his coming is realized. As God unveils to the Apostle John what Christ's return will look like, that's what the word revelation means, right? It's an unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ and all his glory. For 22 chapters, God pulls back the curtain and allows us to see the glory of Jesus. And listen, one thing becomes evident as that curtain is pulled back. When Christ comes again, and he will, it will not be like his first coming. That's what Revelation tells us. It will not be the same. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was spit upon. He was pushed and shoved. He was crucified on a cross. He was clothed in blood. But when he comes again, his enemies will not beat him anymore. They will not mock him anymore. His enemies will do nothing to him. When Christ returns, he will be in glory and he will be clothed with power and the earth will see him and on his robe, on his thigh, he will have the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And every knee on earth will bow and every tongue on earth will confess that Jesus is Lord. The story of the Bible, the story of Christ coming again is the centerpiece. It is the entire theme of these scriptures. Jesus himself in Revelation says, Behold, I am coming to make all things new. And when we open up our minds, when our hearts burn to see this truth from Genesis to Revelation, we see that Jesus is everywhere. He is on every page. In Genesis, he is the seed of a woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the great high priest. In Numbers, 
He is the bronze serpent lifted up. In Deuteronomy, he is a prophet like Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. Samuel, he is our faithful prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is the true king of our nation. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of broken lives. In Esther, he is our Mordecai. In Job, he is our divine mediator. In Psalms, he is God's glorious son. In Proverbs, he is wisdom incarnate. In Ecclesiastes, he is our meaning of life. In Song of Solomon, he is our bridegroom whose desire is for us. In Isaiah, he is our suffering servant. In Jeremiah, he is the branch of David. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the rightful king. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is the one who takes back his adulterous bride. In Joel, he is the stronghold of the nation. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is Lord of the kingdom. In Jonah, he is the great foreign missionary. In Micah, he is the savior from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he is the avenger of his adversaries. In Habakkuk, he is the victory over Satan. In Zephaniah, he is a righteous Lord. In Haggai, he is God's signet ring. In Zechariah, he is the pierced one. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. In Matthew, he is the royal king. In Mark, he is the servant of God. In Luke, he is the son of man. In John, he is the word became flesh. In Acts, he is the fire of his church. In Romans, he is our justifier. In Corinthians, he is our sanctifier. In Galatians, he is our robe of righteousness. In Ephesians, he is the grace that saves us. In Philippians, he is the one whom every knee will bow and tongue confess. In Colossians, he is the all fullness of God in bodily form. In Thessalonians, he is the returning Lord. In Timothy, he is the one who saves us even from our worst. Titus, he is the one who pours out the Holy Spirit to wash and renew us. In Philemon, he is friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he is both high priest and sacrifice. In James, he is the tamer of tongues. In Peter, he is our chief shepherd. In John, he is the love of God. He is the creator. In Jude, he is the one who can keep us from falling. In Revelation, he is king of kings and lord of lords. Listen, listen. On every page, in every chapter, in every verse, every word, Jesus is everywhere. In the Bible, Jesus is everything. It's all about him. It's to him. It's for him. All of scripture, all of human existence is for him. One purpose, one hope, one compelling overriding theme. It's Jesus. Do you feel the burn? There will be justice one day. Behold, one day all things will be made new. All knees will bow. Every tongue confess. Jesus. It is all about Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray. Lord, may each one listening to this passage, each one who hears this message, may their hearts burn for your word. May it be living water to us. May it be the bread of life. May it be the thing that we go back to again and again and again. May it be the word that fulfills us and creates in us a pure heart, O oh God. May it renew a right spirit within us. Give each one the hunger and the thirst to know your word, to be able to preach your word, and to use it, not to judge, but to change lives, to bring each one to salvation. For you are great. You our Lord. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for holding on this, this, these 30 minutes and going through the entire Bible with me. I love you guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.